Chapter 21 is a fun one where we start by talking about balancing nuclear equations and finish by talking about atomic bombs. So let's get into it. Okay. What's nuclear chem all about? Well, the nucleus, right? That's where the name comes from. In pretty much every other chapter across the two semesters, we've been dealing with, primarily anyway, electrons because electrons are involved in bonding. Okay. But in chapter 21, we're thinking about nuclear structure. Okay. In the nucleus, specifically the number of protons and neutrons. Okay. Because nuclear chemistry is a study of reactions that involve changes in the nucleus in some capacity. And in this video, we'll see how those changes happen. Okay. And then we'll elaborate on that in video two. Okay. But to do that, if we're talking about changes in the number of neutrons and protons, we need to remember how to determine those numbers, which is coming all the way back from chapter one. Okay. So protons and neutrons, if you don't remember, right, the atomic number from the periodic table gives you the number of protons. And then to determine the number of neutrons, you take the mass number, right, rounded to the nearest whole number, minus the atomic number. That'll give you the number of neutrons. Two new terms for chapter 21 that you should know from this slide. Okay, number one, we'll use this a lot, nuclide, which is a single type of nucleus, okay, because we'll see reactions can chain nuclides, can change, excuse me, nuclides, okay, and then nucleons. Okay, that's a term that encompasses protons and neutrons together. Okay, there are the subatomic particles as well that you can hear mentioned in nuclear chemistry, right? That's not, doesn't stop at protons, neutrons, and electrons, right? There's quarks for example, and leptons and bosons. But in 21, we're just gonna think about protons and neutrons. Yep. And in the nucleus, we have something that's known as the strong nuclear force. Doesn't get any easier than this name. Yep. This is the force of attraction that holds the nucleus together, which obviously something has to be holding that together because we've got neutrons that are neutral and protons that are all positively charged, which should naturally repel one another but yet we're, cr we're cramming them into this tiny space. Okay. So what's holding the nucleus together and all the nucleons together? Okay. That's called the strong nuclear force. Okay. That's something that only exists at incredibly small distances. Keep in mind, we're talking about subatomic par particles now, 10 to the minus 15 meters, right? So that's 100,000 times smaller than an internuclear distance, sorry, a, um, ionic radius. So it's only existing at very small distances and it's stronger than electrostatic forces because it's overcoming that natural electrostatic repulsion between the two positive charges. So we've got the strong nuclear force. We've also got nuclear binding energy and that we're gonna get to in just a second. How do we get familiar with nuclear binding energy? Okay. Well, what's a unique phenomena is the fact that if we take all the subatomic particles and add their masses together, Okay, so all the protons, all the neutrons, all the electrons that are in an atom, the atom actually weighs slightly less than what we would calculate by adding all those things together. Okay? And that's known as mass defect. Mass defect, the fact that atoms weigh less than what we would get by adding together all the subatomic particles. And that results from some of the mass being converted into energy, okay? relating to nuclear binding energy. The energy produced when atoms, when the atoms, nucle sorry, I was making sure that I didn't have a typo on that slide there. The energy produced when the nucleons from the atom, the protons and the neutrons are bound together. Okay? And nuclear binding energy, just like the strong nuclear force, is much, much, much stronger than chemical bonds. Okay? So it comes from mass being converted into energy. How do we relate those two terms, mass and energy? Okay. Well, it was none other than Albert Einstein that figured out how to relate the amount of energy that we get when some of our mass is converted. Okay. So Albert Einstein, what's the first equation that comes to mind? Well, it's probably this one, right? The mass energy equivalence equation, E equals MC squared. You've seen that plastered all over science since you've been a young kid. And if you were wondering if you'd ever learn how to use it in chemistry, here it is at the end of your second semester. Okay, E equals mc squared. E is energy, m is mass, c is the speed of light in a vacuum, right? 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. 
And these nuclear binding energies, right? We said before, they're stronger than chemical bonds. They are huge. Most chemical reactions, even if it's you know, incredibly exothermic, we're talking thousands of kilojoules per mole. And nuclear binding energies are billions of kilojoules per mole. Super, super strong. So that brings us to nuclear stability. Okay, we know on the periodic table, some things are stable, some things are radioactive. So what do we need to kind of figure out what's what here? Because we're going to be thinking about isotopes later on as well. We call a nucleus stable if it can't be transformed into another configuration without adding external energy. So a different way to think about that, different words, it won't spontaneously transform into another configuration. We can make it happen, but we have to put in energy. Okay? And there are about 250 stable nuclides, type of stable atoms on Earth. Okay? And we can determine stability from a plot of number of neutrons versus the number of protons. And there's an area on this plot that's known as the belt of stability. Right? And what you'll observe when we look at that belt of stability on the next slide is that larger nuclei need more neutrons to overcome proton-proton repulsions. So we start off on a trend of one proton to one neutron, a nice linear curve. But as we get heavier, we need more and more neutrons to help balance out proton-proton repulsions, okay? which brings us to this belt. Right? We've got the belt of stability right there in the middle in purple. And you see that black line right, is a one-to-one -one ratio. And we start off that way, but then we peter off because we need more and more neutrons. Okay? Purple things are stable, they're not radioactive. The green things that surround them are radioactive and the white is just things that don't exist. So how do we predict what, because you obviously can't memorize that graph, how do I predict if something's gonna be stable? Okay? The best chance you have is that if something has an even number of protons and neutrons, if you have an even number of protons, neutrons, or both, they're more likely to be stable. Okay? There are exceptions to all of these rules. Okay? There are also a certain number of nucleons that are considered to be magic numbers because they're more stable against nuclear decay because they make complete shells in the nucleus. It's kind of like electrons way back in chapter six when we were talking about filling orbitals. But keep in mind, we're talking about nucleons, protons, and neutrons. Okay, 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, 126 magic numbers, you don't have to memorize those. Don't worry about that. Yep. Just look at this chart. What's your best chance of having something be stable? Even number of protons, even number of neutrons, right? 157 out of 250, that's the best chance you have for something to be stable. Yep. <clears throat> those green things on the table before, they're outside the band of stability. Okay? Those are the things we call radioactive meaning they spontaneously decay into other nuclei. We don't have to put any energy in to make that happen. Some are fast, some are slow, but they all spontaneously decay into other nuclei. Okay. Those reactions start with one unstable isotope. It's radioactive, we call it a radioisotope, and it decays into another more stable isotope. It might decay into another radioisotope, and then continue to react further, but it always spontaneously reacts to form something that's more stable. Always will form something more stable. Might still be made more radioactive, or sorry, it might still be radioactive, but it's at least somewhat more stable. See what I mean by that in just a second. There are several types of radioactive decay that these things can undergo. Hey, there's nuclear fusion, there's nuclear fission. And we can predict the reaction type, fusion or fission, uh, by looking at something that's known as the binding energy. Okay? Binding energy course, corresponds to the relative stability. Okay? And we take that by the total binding energy in the nucleus uh, divided by the number of nucleons. Okay? So here's an example calculation for helium, okay? 7.1. And right, we can look and correspond to that, 7.1 right over here. All right, well, that's relatively stable. These things at the top here are our most stable. Down here, over here, they undergo fusion or fission. 
depending on where they are in this chart. Okay, so that's why that calculation is important. You would never have to memorize these values, and it's a super simple calculation, right? Binding energy divided by total number of nucleons. You'll have an example looking at that on your sapling, right? Just be aware of the fact that you can use that to predict the reaction type. And those two types of reactions, fusion and fission, can be represented using nuclear equations. Okay? A nuclear reaction is where we have a change in our nuclei, meaning we're changing the number of neutrons, we're changing the number of protons, or we're changing the nuclear energy. Okay? Which means that often, because we're changing protons and neutrons, we see changes in atomic numbers, changes in mass numbers, or changes in energy state. So when we're writing a nuclear equation, which looks a lot different from our usual chemical equations, we have to identify a lot of key pieces of information. The nuclides that are involved, okay, so what specific nuclei we're dealing with, we have to always show their mass numbers in a nuclear equation. We always show the atomic numbers. Okay, you could get that from the symbol, but it's customary just to show it, and any other particles that are involved in the reaction. What do those particles look like? Well, there's six of them that we'll be dealing with, and you should know all six, including their symbols and their scripts, their superscripts and subscripts that are shown on the next slide. We've got protons and neutrons, which we've dealt with before. We have something known as an alpha particle, which is a high energy helium nucleus. A beta particle is a high energy electron. A gamma ray, yeah, we talked about those, they were introduced in chapter six, the highest energy electromagnetic radiation, and then a positron, okay, which is a positively charged electron. Those are all shown in this figure, right? 21.4 from your textbook. The six particles, you should know their name, know their symbol. Okay? That's the key thing, know their symbol more than anything else, and then have an idea of what they are. And the reason you need to know their symbol and their scripts, right? Notice there's nothing on a gamma ray, so you could show it as zero and zero, superscript and subscript. The reason you need to know those scripts is so that you can balance a nuclear equation. And you'll notice when I mentioned a positron, I said a positively charged electron, right? Well, what the heck is that? We've spent now two semesters saying electrons are negatively charged. Well, Positrons are a form of antimatter. The definition of antimatter is a particle with the same mass but opposite state, okay? like a positron with charge. Okay. And you're probably familiar with this point on the bottom, right? When antimatter comes together with matter, both forms are annihilated. The mass is converted into energy in the form of gamma rays. That's the highest possible energy as calculated right, by E equals mc squared. Because we know the mass, we can calculate the energy. Speed of light's constant. So balancing a nuclear reaction. We'll finish the video with this. Instead of showing atoms moving around like all our other chemical equations, balancing nuclear reactions shows the rearrangement of subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, which is why we have to include things like the mass number always. Okay. But the good news is it's not hard because they still follow the conservation laws, conservation of mass, conservation of energy, which that means is that the reactants have to be equal to the products when we add up the sum of all the mass numbers up top, those superscripts, and the sum of all charges. So it's easy to determine the species that are involved. Let's look at a reaction right here, okay? This asks the nucleid, okay? Iodine-125 combines with an electron and produces a new nucleus and no other massive particle. Okay? What is the equation for this reaction? Okay. So when I set that up, okay, iodine-125 is my reactant then I have to know what the symbol is for an electron. Okay. So I go back to my table, all right, I look at an electron. Well, electron's not over here, right? But remember, we defined a beta particle as a high energy electron. So that's a perfect example. 
Right? Anytime you see electron, you can substitute in beta particle, which is why we see two symbols, right? Zero minus one E for electron, zero minus one B for beta. Okay. They represent the same thing. So if you see electron, you sub in beta particle. Beta particle, think about it as an electron, that's fine. But the takeaway for solving this problem, this symbol, whichever one you choose to use, right, is the other reactant. So when I'm setting this up, right, I write it out 125 and 53 as my iodine. Okay, that's one reactant plus my other symbol, zero minus one. E for my electron, and that goes to my product. And sometimes we'll have multiple products, but this says it just produces a new nucleus and no other particles. So to get my answer to this, I add up what's at the top, 125 plus zero is 125. 53 plus negative one is now 52. So now I look at my periodic table, what has an atomic number of 52? And the answer is tellurium. Okay, so tellurium-125 is the product of this reaction. Yeah. Shown on the next slide, here's an example of a bunch more. Balanced nuclear reactions. You'll notice in each situation, all the superscripts, all the subscripts are always equal on each side. There's a lot of different types of reactions that are shown on here. Notice some involve an alpha particle. Another one involves right, hydrogen, a neutron down there on the bottom. Okay? So there's a couple of different types of nuclear reactions, and we'll discuss those in video number two.